Anyway. What do, you, what do you say to people that say that climate change isn't human caused, that it's just a natural cycle? Well, there, I say, it's nice to say that, but there's no, not only is there no evidence of it, I guess if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And the point is, it's not rocket science. You, can, you know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, as is methane and other things, and you, can, you know the energy coming in from the sun, you can do the energy flows. And you can say, how much heat is being trapped by carbon dioxide? What, what are the predicted generic? I mean, uh, model, climate modeling in detail is very complicated, but what's the energetics of energy in, energy out, and therefore energy stored? And you do that, and you find out the impacts of what's happening are completely consistent with what that simple prediction. Now you say, well, maybe that could be just totally wrong. But when a simple calculation that's a basic physics gives you something that generically agrees with what's happening, you should suspect that that's probably the case. And as I say, it's not what people used to say was, well, these models are uncertain. And there's still some people who, some, even some scientists who I've debated, who would argue that, well, the modeling of exactly what, the, what, what sea level rise, what temperature increase is gonna occur, are, are uncertain, and they are. Uncertainty is a key part of science, which is important because we can estimate the uncertainty. But it's not prediction in the future, it's the fact that it's already happening that you can see sea level rise already happening. You can see ocean acidification happening because um, what happens is that when there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, some of it gets dissolved in the ocean water as carbonic acid, making the ocean more ac acidic. And you can see the pH level in the ocean changing by exactly the amount you'd predict if the uh, carbon dioxide level is increasing. It's just basic chemistry. And that, of course, is impacting on, and will impact on oceans 2.0, on, on, on on ocean life, so these things are really happening now, and uh, and I think that's the more important aspect of this is that sure there's uncertainties, and whether in 2100 the the temperature increase will be five degrees or three degrees or ten degrees, which again doesn't sound like a lot, but five degrees is more than the than the, the temperature change from 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 ice ages to the to the hottest areas we know. We are we are creating an Earth that has already at the carbon levels in the atmosphere that has not been seen for over five million years. I mean, it's Earth 2.0 and it's already that way right now. And the last little, you know, you got me on a soapbox, but the last thing I'll say about this is, people used to say, well, we have, one of the arguments that, that certain people use in the United States is to say, well, yeah, this may be a problem, but we can't afford to deal with it right now. I mean, we've got other pressing financial problems. Now, of course, one of the responses is, Cleaning up after hurricanes, it costs a lot more than, than preventing in some ways. And so money spent preventing problems usually is a lot less than, 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 the, than cleaning up afterwards. Plus the economic option, opportunities that come from developing new technologies that address these problems is one thing. But it's, it's, um, it's more than that. It's that, so because every bit of carbon we add to the atmosphere now stays there, what we've added in all of human industrial activity is there already. And if we want to keep the level below a certain amount, and it was used to be around below 400 parts per million, and are now at 415 already, the problem is, you say, what, what, is, what is required? What kind of breaks or changes to the world economy do you need to do? Well, 10 years ago, to keep the levels down to the IPCC target level, you would have had to cut carbon 5% per year. But because in the intervening 10 years, in the intervening decade, we put in 60 billion tons of carbon each year, roughly, I think, into the atmosphere, because we've been doing that, now to reach the same level, you'd have to cut it 9%. But if we stop, if we don't do that, you see what happens is every year you continue to add that, the challenge to technology to keep things at the level you want at is much greater. So it's not, you can't push 20 years into the future and say, well, we'll deal with this problem 20 years in the future, because the problem will be a very different one 20 years in the future. Are you hopeful? Are we gonna figure this out? It depends on the day. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, I, I have great faith in technology to be able to address problems, and in scientists and creative, creative scientists and engineers being able to address problems. So in that sense, I'm hopeful. And the children. And the, ch the children, yeah, get, to get back to your original question, which we deviated from, the fact that young people seem universally to be addressing this problem means that certainly 
there'll be a consensus, at least in the first world, that this problem has to be dealt with by people who are, will then be in political power and who will, in the interim, be able to vote, um, gives me great faith. But at the same time, the, 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 the negative part of my, my, my consciousness tells me that what, why I'm worrying more is, is humans' ability to, the, to govern, to think globally, deal with the, the socio-political problems that are going to result. I think technologically we can deal with it, but I, I, I just, if I look around the world now and I see that what's happening in terms of xenophobia and, and, and denial and, uh, it, and, and the, the ways that technology can impact on changing people's views in a way that can impact on democracy itself, I have severe concerns. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, it's one thing when, you know, 40,000 people are trying to cross a border. It's another thing when 40 million people are leaving their country via boat because they can't survive. Yeah, and you can, you can exactly, and you can, you can affect public opinion in two ways. Uh, and, and the way it will be affected is to make sure that the people, that, that threats, that these people are viewed as threats, as they are being now. The simplest way, look, uh, that manipulated Brexit. The, uh, the idea that 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 there's a that there's a that this horde of people from Ill illegal immigration in Europe that are going to be in England and then you know the England can't be England anymore the most effective way to govern people is by making them afraid it was it was i think goebbels uh, who, who said from in in or in uh, in Nazi Germany that democracy or dictatorship doesn't matter you want to make people do what you want them to do make them afraid and i think that that's the effective way of dealing with things right now. And you make people afraid and they're willing to vote or act against their own self-interest because of that fear. And how can you overcome fear? Well, I'm an educator, so I'm biased, but it seems to me the only way ultimately is to, is to give information and try and educate. And that's one of the reasons why I do some of the things I try and do and is to try and open up and get people thinking about about these problems uh, not necessarily believing me or or any of the people i have may have on but get them interested enough to begin to research the problems and that means in the modern world not going into your echo chamber not going into your favorite sites on the internet where you get all your information which may be wrong or biased but we want to look broadly and it means training young people the same young people who are not buying the the nonsense that's being thrown at them by the, the propaganda about climate change. Skepticism in young people is to me the greatest hope. Uh, when, and, and I grew up in the, in, the, in the 60s, and so for me, I saw young people protesting the war. And, and it created, uh, for me at least at the time, I thought a generation of people who would say, we're not gonna buy this nonsense. We're, going to, we're not gonna buy the lies. And, and I had great hope for the world as a result, that we, that, but, it's, but that hope was misplaced in some sense. But be, breeding skepticism in young people is very important, and then training them to be skeptical and to figure out how to gain information, not in a world where education before used to be just sort of throwing things at kids in schools and amassing a certain amount of information, but that's useless because there's more information in the iPad you're holding, if it's an iPad, than, than, than you could get in all schools. There's more misinformation, too. And what we have to train young people to do, because it's too late for the old people, is to be able to learn how to tell the wheat from the chaff in, in what they get from the Internet, there's, to, how, how to sift out information, how to check sources. That's the kind of training we need to do in schools. Of course, we need to teach them how to read and write and do mathematics, but beyond that, the kind of learning tools that'll be necessary to be a productive and viable adult voting human being in the, in the rest of the 21st century will be very different than it was before. And if you don't have those tools, then you're much more easily manipulated by whoever is, 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 is in power.